Greetings, my name is Mike Grain. Welcome to another Walton Supply Chain Center edition of On Shelf Availability. Today, we flip the script a little bit, and Tony D'Onofrio actually interviews me about the opportunity of RFID at retail. Let's go ahead and join in his progress. Uh, and I, I agree with that in terms of this, but let's keep going because we've got a lot to cover. We also have a lot of questions, so I will get to some of these questions. So I really appreciate the audience engagement. So this is actually one of your charts in terms of um, uh, interesting uh, tidbits in terms of stats. So can you highlight the ones that are important to you? Yeah. So my perspective is this, this goes back to kind of the co the comment I made before, which is, you know, people are noticing that product continues to have uh, on shelf availability issues, whether it's canned foods or toiletries, et cetera. These items are important items for the customer to have things delivered to their home and or to be pick up in store. Uh, this next one is, is pretty interesting because what you're saying is, without sending or actually sending the message to a shopper your availability gives them an indication of whether they're going to come back and shop this li this limited lo loyalty i think is pretty important we've all gone into a store before and the thing has just been demolished there's out of stocks everywhere there's trash everywhere etc you can put up with that once or twice but if that's a consistent behavior you're probably going to go plus somewhere else because if that's the way they run the store that's not good. So 80% of shoppers have noticed that shelves are out of stock or low stock than usual than a year ago. So shoppers are making those determinations. And now what's happening, what's fascinating is you have retailers who normally were responsible for stocking the shelves and taking the customer money. In a lot of scenarios, they're adding a third leg to their platform, which is shopping on behalf of customers. So you're having the retailer actually do the shopping and simulating what it feels like for a customer, and they're complaining the stuff is out of stock all the time. So interesting transition. Bottom bottom line is this certainly goes back to Sam Walton's quote. You know, at the end of the day, you disappoint a customer, they're going to go somewhere else. And so that's, that's totally incorrect. Yep. Well, I'm going to quickly want you to answer a couple of the questions because we're getting a lot of questions. So one of them Absolutely. is sustain sustainability. How does RFID help with sustainability, do you think? reducing waste and su supporting the sustainability efforts. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple. Actually, some people would argue RFID goes against sustainability, right? Because you're putting an actual RFID tag on product that, quote, doesn't make it sustainable anymore. Now, I am not a recycling expert by any stretch of the imagination, but as I talked to my friends at Avery Dennison, they said one of the things that happens when something like a piece of cardboard gets recycled is they end up turning that paper into more of a slurry or a slush and the metal kind of falls to the bottom. So there is a recyclability component to that. Here's the other thing. I think we need to kind of think outside the box if you actually RFID individual selling units. I wonder if RFID could be used, just think it outside the box, in the landfills to find out how much of that product is coming in that potentially could have been recycled and it really got thrown away. So instead of thinking about it as a negative, let's think about it as can we leverage RFID even in things like landfills to figure out what percentage of the stuff is being thrown away versus recycled. Yeah, and I think you can also track, you know, point of origin. You can also track in terms of uh, what happens to it through the supply chain yep. to make sure it gets sold at the right time. So in other words, making sure the right products are on the shelf sooner so you can sell them and you're not actually throwing them away. So there's all kinds of other ways that I think RFID can cut, can cut uh, well, the, the wastage. In the food area, to me, there's a untapped potential in the food area. When you start thinking about how much food gets tossed, Correct. and unfortunately, let's go back to the personnel. We call it personnel issues. Sometimes personnel issues are, hey, we didn't go through today and actually go through all of our bread to make sure that we put some of this that was made a couple of days ago on a reduced for quick sale rack. So instead of doing a markdown where we take a little bit of loss, we end up having to throw it away. Well, throwing away food is not a big idea, right? That's a bad idea. So if we can start to leverage RFID because RFID has not only, we'll get, you know, we'll, we'll talk about probably this later, RFID gets you ability that says, 
not only that this is a UPC, but I know exactly when this product was delivered or created or baked or whatever it happens to be. Add four days to it. That's when I need to mark it down. Add two more days to it. That's when I need to throw it away. So I can start to reduce and mark down things rather than throwing away. And to me, that's a that's a big idea from a from a food waste perspective. Yeah, and let me ask the other question because at the end, the retailer actually clarified they were looking for. Are we going to get to some places like uh, um, basically so or stagging some of these high tap items like cough and cold and allergy and face care? Some of these products that are being stolen or not, can we get to source staying? And then how do actually get that started as a process is what they were actually asking. Not well, the pharmacy, not the pharmaceutical. Yeah, and that's a that's a great question. Unfortunately, every time you ask a question, you end up pointing back to yourself because the only ones, the, the programs that I've seen that are more successful, the most successful, is when a retailer decides they're going to implement RFID and their expectation with their suppliers, it's tagged at source. It gets tagged at the source when it gets manufactured. If you try and tag it at a distribution center or even even worse in a store, you can do it for a while, but that becomes very, 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 very challenging to make sure everything's tagged correctly. So supplier, if we talk about the success model of RFID and apparel, let's talk about a couple things. Number one, for the most part, it's tagged at store source. Forget the vertical folks for a second, but for people like Walmart and Dick's Sporting Goods and Nordstrom's and Target, their expectation is suppliers, we expect you to tag it at source. We expect it to be source tagged all the way through the supply chain, and we start taking advantage of that those tags there. So, so back to the retailer, whoever asked that question, it's not a quick fix, but here's the deal. If you think cough cold should be RFID tagged and you want to be able to leverage that, you got to start engaging with your suppliers now, make a decision. First off, get a sponsor who's going to drive this from a business standpoint at your retail organization. It's high enough that's operations and merchandising. Number two, decide you're going to leverage RFID for the purpose of, of knowing what you have and where it's located. Number three, come up with a source tagging plan and communicate that to your suppliers and hold them accountable to that. And then while that's her product is getting source tagged and it's coming through the supply chain, you're standing up your RFID solution uh, to take advantage of those tags when it hits the store. That would be my recommendation. People aren't going to just start source tagging it just because they're going to source tag it because somebody said, this is an expectation I have of doing business with us. I would also say as crazy as this sounds, Tony, Major retailers who are direct competitors need to collaborate and make recommendations on yeah. categories. You're, you're smiling like, uh-oh, I want some more just open up. No, no, no. You're totally correct. You are totally, I think, totally correct. I think it's okay just to call this out. Walmart and Target and CVS and Walgreens, if you all get together and go, hey, we all want to do cough coal. Let's just call out cough coal with RFID. Walmart doing saying it versus Target, et cetera. That becomes kind of a well, you know, they're asking for it and they're not. And so if I'm a if I'm a cough coal, I'm go well. I'll tag some of this stuff, et cetera, to drive substantial change in the industry. If you all get together, and go. We're all going to ask for this over the next couple of years. Why don't you go ahead and tag it all? Because then the supplier is going to start leveraging. Number one, they don't have to have, well, this SKU is tagged and this one isn't, so I'll create a different SKU for it. They can tag it all and they can start leveraging RFID in their own facility. So if the retailers, and in, in, in this idea of collaborating across retailers sounds like it's uh, uh, antitrust violation, it's not. It's just setting expectations saying, we're all going to look for the same thing. So if you're going to start doing tagging for a retailer, then tag it all. Because eventually all the retailers are going to take advantage of it. No, you've nailed it. That's exactly it. It starts with the retailer and then from there you work through the rest. But let's keep going because I want to do want to get to those use cases and all that and we're going to run out of time. <laughs> I'm going to quickly stay on this chart because they're asking a lot of good questions. Uh, this chart is actually one of mine and what it shows that Prime members, Amazon Prime members, first of all, there's a lot of them. There's 200 plus million of them and they're Prime to actually switch immediately if you're out of stock, that's number one that's on the chart. The other thing that's on this chart, it says that who do you trust? They actually have it in stock. The highest trust is not in a retailer, it's an Amazon. 
So that gives you an idea how important it is for retail to actually get their in stock under control. So that's my comment. What do you think? Yeah, well, I've got a I've got a different uh, slide from IHL that I typically quote. It's a little bit different than this, which is, and this is pretty amazing. Amazon Prime customers, when face and out of stocks, are seventy three percent more likely to use their own phone to, to order stuff. Here's the other one: twenty four percent of all of Amazon's current. I'm sorry, twenty five percent of Amazon's current revenue comes from customers who tried to buy it in the store first. And then that that's a soundbite for you. Here's what's an amazing soundbite. Here, here's what Amazon's got. They don't have customers coming in and pr- taking product and putting it on the other side of the store so nobody can find it. They don't have organized retail crime people going into their warehouses and stealing stuff. They don't have customers stealing stuff. They don't have associates or, or employees stealing stuff, right? They don't have, for the most part, they do a pretty good job of making sure they get you know get paid for everything they received at the distribution center well so so amazon doesn't have a what do i have and where's it located i've never done an out of stock study or a on hand accuracy study which is the term that we typically look at my guess is in an amazon fulfillment center your on hand accuracy is pretty good you know what you have and you know what's located you open it up to a retail store where you have thousands of people running around the store all the time. Who knows where your stuff's going to show up? So by definition, Amazon's going to be better. Here's what I would argue. I would argue that customers want to be able to support businesses near them. And if I've got, and I'm just going to toot Walmart's on a little bit, if 90% or 95% of the U.S. population is within 10 miles of a Walmart store, and I can get something in an hour versus a day or two from Amazon... I'm going with that, right? So I, I like I like the people who are omni-channel, who have both brick and mortar f- locations as well as omni-channel. I like their their ability to be able to win in the, in the future. But Amazon is clearly taking market share from a lot of brick and mortar retailers because they don't know what they have and they know where it's located. That's where Amazon's going to win. And that again brings back to exactly your full point about how important a shop ability is. So. Let me keep going again. Yep. This is actually again from you. So tell me what this is telling you. Yeah, I've, I've kind of mentioned this one already a couple of times because okay. because knowing what you have and know where it's located without human intervention, that means nobody scanning stuff and nobody doing audits and nobody taking a gun. Our personnel are valuable resources in a store. They should be there to take care of the customer. They shouldn't be there to scan stuff, to wand stuff. I, I understand that that's a part of the re- expectation, but this to me is a big idea. Can you tell me what you have in the store and where is it located without human intervention, without somebody scanning and wanding and doing all this other kind of what? That to me is going to be a disruptor in the retail industry. If I can literally virtually lift the lid off a store and look down and go, hey, I'm looking for this particular printer cartridge. Oh, I've got two here, three here, and one here without somebody going and scanning it. That's a game changer. And and we've got to figure out how to get there because what we also want to do is expose those on hands to customers to go, no, I have three of them. They're right here. I know exactly where they're located. Today, retailers hide inventory from customers because they're not sure if they really have three. So I don't want to tell them three and then disappoint them. They hide that inventory. Dr. Hargrave calls that, well, I'm just hiding inventory. That's because I don't want to disappoint a customer. Well, if I know exactly what I have and where it's located without a human being having to go look, that's a disruptor in the retail industry. And I think it's a big opportunity. Totally agree. Uh, Let me keep going again, just to make sure we cover some. So retailer adoption seems to be increasing. So general trends that you're seeing, I know there's some logos on here, but general trends that you're seeing in terms of the adoption rates. From from each one of these retailers have publicly communicated that they are leveraging radio frequency identification as the ability, as one of the tools to be able to understand what they have and where it's located. And and I don't think that trend is gonna change. I think it's gonna continue to grow to our conversation earlier. I think other categories beyond apparel, these are all for the most part, Focusing on apparel, I think things like home and general merchandise and electronics and sporting goods, 
those are all coming down the road. So if you're in any of those general merchandise categories, you might as well figure out what RFID is because you're going to eventually be asked by one of your retail partners uh, to put RFID tags on the product. I don't think there's any definite about, and a question about that. I agree. Uh, let's let's move on to the. This is actually talking to the actual adoption rates, and this is one of your charts. Yep. So you want to talk to this one? Well, it's not one of my charts. It's one of Auburn RFID charts. This is Justin Patton's chart. But this was shown at uh, RFID Journal this year. Uh, obviously, you can see the growth from 2018 with $14 billion to $45 billion in 2023. It's growing outside of just retail as well. This chart was actually given by the, the folks from UPS, which are fully leveraging RFID for package tracking inside their supply chain. Uh, again, that's public knowledge, so I'm not sharing anything that I, I shouldn't be sharing, but they are clearly leveraging that. It, basically, you want to be able to, to know what you have and where it's located, even the package industry. Uh, I, I think $45 billion is probably a pretty good estimate, and I would expect that 2024 or beyond, it, the, the numbers are going to continue to grow. I don't think there's any question about that. I agree. And in fact, the next chart talks exactly about the same thing in terms of the adoption rate increasing, and you can see even... Avery does, but what's what's optimistic on here that points to the other questions is actually in the bottom right. Uh, what it's saying is that apparel was the major driver in 22, but if you look at even Avery Dennison pipeline in 23 and beyond, it's actually well beyond just apparel. So it's going into much broader categories, which tells you that uh, the retailer that asked the question about some of the other categories, it is happening, but. Ultimately, it's got to be driven by the retailers. So I don't know if you want to make any short comments because I want to get to the use case. Yeah. That's an important topic. Yeah. So, so here's the other thing that a retailer can help with. Collaborating with other retailers and say, we want to go this way with RFID. Let me give you an example. Right now, we, we know how to do RFID for a pair of socks, apparel. We know how to do it for shoes. We know how to do it for electronics. You start getting into categories like beauty, specifically cosmetics, fragrances, et cetera. Lots of challenges, very small product, very, very aesthetically, it has to be aesthetically uh, pleasing. I, could, I can't just slap a big old RFID tag on a thing lipstick and allow it to be aesthetically pleasing. So there's some R&D that has to be happening uh, on the front end of this with some of the tag suppliers and, and the, the packaging folks to figure out how do you make this work but it actually not destroy the, the the professionalism and the artwork, et cetera. So here's the deal. Don't just decide, hey, tomorrow we're going to do RFID for cosmetics. Let's go ahead and work with the industry now and tell the Avery Denisons of the world and folks like that, that hey, we're going this way. They probably already know it. But if you start to get a lot of retailers going, we want to go this way for cosmetics, we want to have that work done before the ask has even occurred. And that, that to me is the importance of working in this industry. Um, because here's the deal. When a supplier like Max Factor puts an RFID tag, it has to be aesthetically pleasing. It has to work. And by the way, I want to do it one way for all my retailers, leveraging GS1 standards and Auburn standards. I can't have a different way to do it from Walmart versus Target, et cetera. It's got to be one way to make it easier for adoption. But to me, that's what's going to be really the issue right now to me, there's a challenge with just the aesthetics and, and uh, the, the ability to make a tag small enough that it actually reads and works effectively. So we need to work. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree because the branding folks are going to be the, the biggest barrier to actually getting anything done in yep. the store if you totally destroy that beautiful packaging that they design. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so but like, totally cosmetics is a no-brainer for me. You want to talk about something that's hard to know, what do you have and where's it located? And a customer who's going to go in and go, I'm not, I don't want that shade. I want this shade and you don't have that shade. I don't care how many thousand shades you got. If you don't have the one that my wife's looking for, you know, you're out of stock and right. order from Amazon. So That's a huge right. opportunity in the cosmetics, by the way, for, for the, for shrink as well. So this is another chart that talks about counterfeiting data and that was this in the, yeah, but Go to the next one too, because 2017 was a small number. Now it's gotten bigger. So yeah, this actually was one of the questions. That's why I wanted to include it. This is actually one of the questions I came in. All of the things that we've talked about so far have been 
knowing what I have inside a physical store and knowing where it's located. RFID does a really, really good job of doing that. As we start to think about other UK, so remember we said we're going to tag it at source. So when it's manufactured, we're going to tag it. One of the things that retailers and suppliers have, and I'm just going to pick on this bottom number here, claims. Tony, I ordered 52 of something from you and I only got 20. Okay? So I'm going to create a claim against you. And your answer is, based upon us, we sent you all 50. Well, I only got 20. Well, I sent you 50. And we play this game back and forth, back and forth, right? We have no data other than to say, I sh- I shipped it. Well, I didn't get it. But that's, that's about the only thing you got. If you start leveraging RFID, I go, okay, you asked for 50. Here are the 50, what I'm going to call serialized numbers that I'm putting in a case that's going to you. And when you get them, if you don't get all 50, then I can prove to you that when they left my facility, they're all 50 were there. If you only got 20, then let's go talk to whoever transported it because they probably took some out of the box, right? It puts accountability, again, without somebody sitting there scanning everything and auditing things, it allows us to be able to leverage, did I actually get what I paid for? And the argument goes away. So claims are a huge opportunity. Counterfeiting. People like Nike spend millions of dollars, billions of dollars on that Nike swoosh. It's not hard to rip off that Nike swoosh and send a whole bunch of stuff into a retailer going, well, this is Nike product, but I'm selling it for half the cost. Well, wait a minute. Now you're creating a negative situation for Nike where you're selling my brand at less than half the cost. It's because it's counterfeit. So whether it's pharmaceuticals or brand branded items like Nike, I can now tell you these are the serialized numbers of every single Nike item. If you're get, selling Nike stuff that's not one of these serial numbers, it's counterfeit. Do something about it, right? It gives you the ability to track that, including did I really get the right pharmaceuticals? Did I get the right prescription, et cetera? Counterfeiting and claims have a huge opportunity. And then we're I'm sure we're going to talk about shrink here in a second in the retail store. But to me, these are updated numbers. These are big, big numbers that we have the potential with RFID to be able to provide the visibility we need to be able to have that awareness. I agree. Let me keep going here just to make sure. So use cases, is one of my favorite charts. Let's <laughs> talk about use cases. I'm going to let you tackle it first. Oh boy. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk fast. So where most retailers start is the bottom of the triangle. If I improve my on-hand accuracy and AKA know what I have and know where it's located, I should be able to have the product available for the customers. I should be able to increase sales. I don't think a 2% increase in sales is out of the question for anybody. Matter of fact, side note, Auburn University and I are actually doing a research project with three universities to measure on-hand accuracy and its impact on sales and buy online, pick up and store and inventory levels. We're going to execute that in 2024, more to follow there, but it's going to come out of the Auburn University. People want to know if I get, if I move from on-hand accuracy from 50% to 95%, what kind of sales lift do I get? What kind of online uh, impact do I have? So that's that's the base of the triangle where everybody starts. I think the next set of use cases, and I'll put it a shameless plug because I have uh, my good friend Joe Cole from Macy's going to be joining me on an upcoming podcast, leveraging um, RFID for the purpose of asset protection, knowing exactly what you got. Did I get everything I paid for from a receiving standpoint? And did things leave the store that got paid for? Or did things more importantly leave the store that didn't get paid for to me and this will this will be interesting given given uh uh, the folks uh at people like sensormatic they've traditionally used electronic article surveillance to do that great technology it's going to be around for a while but that all, all it does is say something's leaving the building didn't get paid for rfid allows me to know exactly what the left of the store when it left the store and exactly what was in that particular store and then we could talk about asset protection for a long time. To me, asset protection is a big issue right now in the industry, more than ever. RFID has the ability to give the information that people need to know where is this leading, if you will, coming from. Um, we've already talked about elimination of food waste. We already mentioned that with the markdowns. 
the claims reduction, I kind of walked you through that with the whole, you sent me 25 and I expected 50, et cetera. Um, the other two here are backroom picking. Um, people are going to start to get, and we'll, we'll flip to the next slide here in a second. People are going to start to look at other use cases beyond just, is my inventory accurate? And that's going to require potentially fixed infra infrastructure to do that. And the last one is supplier insights. They're spending 25 years with p and I can tell all I can see is how much I ship to you or how much I sell. I can't see where it's selling from. RFID and fixed infrastructure allows me to know exactly where the product's being sold from. Uh, and a lot of other information that I believe suppliers would be willing to, to, to help monetize and take advantage of to really understand where their stuff is selling from. Yeah, good point. And we're actually going to make these charts available to the audience. Okay. I'm just going to quickly say that in the lost prevention space, just to reinforce it, RFID came out as number one technology <laughs> in the latest NRF shrink survey. So it is top of mind and some retailers are doing a really good job. And again, we're going to make these charts available. What I want to make sure we get to this, because in terms of the variety of ways that you can actually apply RFID. So go ahead, Michael, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, and I, and I will take you through all of these various things. They, it relates back to that triangle slide I said before. So if all you want to do is measure on-hand accuracy and on-shelf availability and markdown, the data capture, so there's two parts of RFID. There's the tag itself, and then there's the data capture, which is how do you, how do you read those tags. If you do a cycle count once a week, once every two weeks, once a day, it doesn't matter, the things you could do with it are basically in this this top left hand car which is on hand accuracy uh fill rate markdowns and potentially eliminating the annual inventory as you do as you start leveraging it for backroom to back of house to front of house replenishment real-time updates location accuracy asset tracking shrink reporting etc you start to have to need something that looks like a minimal viable product uh, that looks like some fixed infrastructures at the back of the store, transition to the sales floor and the exit of the store. And this thing over there on the right hand side next to this fixed reader is basically a robot. There's an opportunity to have robotics. Uh, there's a company out there like Badger Robotics that actually has our uh, robotics that scan the shelf. Uh, they, ha they can have RFID readers on them as well. So you don't have to give somebody a wand and manually collect it. And then you get all the way over here to, to what I would say is the full fixed infrastructure where it's continuously reading all the time. Uh, and there's a lot more things you can do it in terms of real-time updates, location accuracy, real-time, electronic proof of delivery, and some other things like that. Again, Tony, th we can take, this is probably a podcast by itself to go through all this. I, I agree. Try and, I, I don't want to try and minimize it, but you have to understand your business case, which is that triangle, and then say, okay, I'm going to get into this business. What's the data capture? Most people do a wand first, which is great. But if you want to leverage some of the asset protection and real-time continuous monitoring, you got to invest in infrastructure that's beyond a wand. I totally agree. And in fact, there are some retailers already moving towards the full infrastructure, but it was a journey. It wasn't, you start in different places and end up in different places, depending on where you're at on your journey. So let me go to this slide, which had some important additional thoughts that I want you to start wrapping us up with. Yeah. So let me let me wrap it up with a couple of things. And this kind of sound you know, a little bit confusing, but I but I think it's important to cover. Number one, if you, we have already talked about if you're a retailer that's an apparel retailer or a sporting retailer, I can see a day where 100 percent of your business is going to be RFID. No question about it. If you're a club or a mass merchandiser, like a Walmart or a Target, you're going to have to come up with different sensor signals that are going to be able to tell you what do I have and where is it located. Some of your product will be RFID. Great. Some of it will have to require computer vision. Some of it will be 2D barcode. Some of it will be Digimark. Some of it will be Bluetooth. Uh, not, not to try and go into details, but each item is going to have to have a different sensor that said they all feed into ability to say, what do I have and where is it located? Number two, serialization. Um, RFID's premise is a UPC and a unique serial number. And Tony, you and I well know, we've been around retail long enough that UPC quantity has always been what it is. So it's a G10 or the UPC, I've got five of them. Well, with serialization, which is part of RFID, but it doesn't have to be RFID, Sunrise 2027 is going to give you a new platform where every retailer is going to be able to scan a 2D barcode, 
which gives you a lot more information. So when I think about serialization, that means a UPC and a unique number, almost like the VIN number of your car, unique to that selling item, which the exact same item below it, same UPC, has a different VIN number. So serialization or serialized G10s are going to be the future. People who are not familiar with that concept need to understand uh, Sunrise 2027, which is part of GS1. And the only other two are just, hey, we talk a lot about this kind of stuff on the onshelfavailability.com platform and conversations on retail. Stay up to speed of this. Put it as part of your podcast because there's stuff coming all the time that I think it's important for the retailers and the suppliers community to understand. So excellent, excellent uh, webinar. Uh, my, you did an excellent job being on the other side of the microphone. <laughs> so congratulations. So you're going to have to give me that test at some point. So we'll have to alternate and do this. But it's been a pleasure. I know there, there are some questions. Let me ask real quick, and we got a minute. So absolutely, uh, any new innovation that excites you in RFID right now? Any unique, well, here's the deal. RFID has been the same since we put the first tag on a you know World War II plane, right? I mean, it, it's been the same. What's interesting is two things. Number one, I think it's interesting that we have other use cases other than what do I have and where is it located? That to me is the, that triangle is, is interesting because we've always asked for it to be su supplier source tag. Now, with claims and some of those other things, I think we will definitely uh, see the value of doing it upstream, number one. Number two, and the shameless plug for Auburn, we're seeing it in other verticals as well. So things like aircraft, uh, for those of you who are potentially gonna go to the RFID board meeting coming up here in September, we're gonna ha host it at Cape Canaveral. NASA uses RFID a lot. Uh, we're, we're seeing it in food service industry. McDonald's is using it for, for things. So what's interesting is the technology hasn't fundamentally changed. People are just coming up with more and more use cases beyond just you know, you know, toll roads and and uh, car washes. They're using it for other things, and it's really starting to make an impact to the industry. Well, excellent. Well, thank you very much to the entire audience. We appreciate. Uh, look for the replay for the ones that were not able. We do have a big retail event coming up October 18. Look for that in my social media channel. We got people on there from around the world that will speak about the future of retail. And with that, signing off. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Yep. Have a great day, everybody. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Tony D'Onofrio and I. Join us next time as we get back into the RFID, but this time we talk to a retailer. We get a chance to talk to Joe Cole, who's the Vice President of Asset Protection at Macy's, about how he's leveraging RFID in the Macy's Corporation. He'll be joined by Randy Dunn of the Zebra Corporation. Look forward to talking to you then.